we can find an effective balance between the needs of Main Street and the needs of Wall Street. Both play important but very different roles. Both require different types of regulation and support. If you look at what happened leading up to the crisis, much of the problem stemmed from what was called the shadow banking system, players and markets that were out of the reach of the current regulations. It has been observed that it was not so much a failure of the existing laws and regulations, rather that we didn't have the right laws and regulations to place the cover and new, the newly sophisticated instruments and practices that had evolved in the 21st century. These included SIVs, structured investment vehicles, CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, just to name a few. Who really understood them and the havoc they could wreak on the markets? One example we've heard a lot about is the subprime mortgage meltdown. It was largely a result of mortgage brokers, Wall Street speculators, and poorly rated securities. Not what I think we think of as traditional banking activities. From 2000 to 2006, we saw a seismic shift in mortgage financing. In 2000, 84% of all mortgage loans originated were fixed rate. By 2006, that had dropped to 45%, with the majority of loans carrying adjustable interest rates. In 2000, only 5% of mortgage loans were subprime loans. In 2006, 30% were subprime. And 75% of those were originated outside of the banking system. And there was one other very important shift. These subprime loans were being packaged and sold into securitization markets throughout the world. Many of these loans should never have been made. Underwriting criteria started basing loans on stated income. There were no credit checks. 100% financing was easily available. And interest rates were low for the first two or three years and then scheduled to increase sharply after that. But not to worry. <coughs> By that time, your house will be worth a lot more, right? <laughs> Wrong. The residential real estate bubble burst. The music stopped, and it was ugly. Housing prices fell for the first time since World War II. The remaining principal amounts on the loans were greater than the properties were worth. Foreclosures skyrocketed. And the additional wrinkle was that these, solds were pack these loans were sold and packaged to investors. Wall Street had no skin in the game. The risk was being borne by investors all over the world. Investors like the tiny town of Narvik, Norway. I remember reading last spring that this town of 18,000 people found itself on the verge of financial collapse because it had invested all of its funds in subprime securitizations, thinking that it carried a rating that made it a bond. It's just an example of the shadow banking system at work, or perhaps more accurately, of what didn't work. It is clear that lessons need to be learned. But it is encouraging that the response to the questionable practices that cause so much harm, our industry and our government leaders seem to be coalescing around a goal of having a well-managed, well-capitalized, and well-regulated private financial system. We have learned many things in the past year, but I would like to point to three lessons of particular importance to our financial future and our ability to prevent similar events from happening again. First, never before has it been so obvious that the world's markets are interconnected and built on a foundation of trust and confidence. We had a global crisis of confidence that shook the foundation to its core. We lost that confidence and we have yet to gain it back completely. Second, we have a better understanding of the systemic risk that can be spawned by the actions of some of the biggest fish in the global economic waters, people who should have known better. Once again, tradition and fundamentals have won out. We have to be skeptical of new schemes based on complex ways to profit, which have no relationship to the goods and services that provide real value. As Warren Buffett has said, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. The Oracle of Omaha also said, only when the tide goes out 
do you discover who's been swimming naked? <laughs> I think we found out a lot of people were skinny dipping in the pool. <laughs> and the third lesson, the potential of a global economic meltdown was very real. And once unleashed, it would have been very difficult to reverse. Drastic conditions led to drastic measures. But as painful as those measures were, they did help stop the bleeding. The global economic environment has changed forever. And while those of us in business are still grappling with what that reset economy will mean for all of us, because it certainly won't be back to business as usual, the bigger question is, when will the citizens and businesses on Main Street feel good about the economy and their future? And we'll know we're on the right track when people can say, I'm confident I have a job, the value of my house is stable or increasing, and I have the money to send my children to school. And I think it's pretty obvious that we're not there yet. It is understandable that it will take some time for us individually and collectively to address the new and unforeseen challenges we face. It's not just about when the cycle will turn. Certain things about the markets will never be the same. But our traditional values, our common sense knowledge of what creates real value and what leads to greater prosperity remain just as relevant as it always was. It's back to basics. If we want to get back to basics, we have to focus on the strengths that build real value. We've done it throughout our history, and we can do it again. So what are those strengths? What is it that makes this country unique? Where have we traditionally led the way for others to follow? Our country has many strengths, but if you asked me, I would cite invention, innovation, and entrepreneurship will be key. Technology is also the transformation of our lifetime. With the internet, a whole generation of innovators and inventors have a world of knowledge at their fingertips. Of course, technology also enabled many of the financial abuses, so we're going to need to use it wisely. That said, we have the seeds for our generation to build economic prosperity, to bring about change for the better by using our judgment, our perspective, and our experience. What we do today can define the future and help launch a new generation that recognizes the importance of innovation, invention, and has the skills and the ability to be entrepreneurs. I am confident that in both the short and the long term, there will continue to be opportunities for new businesses to form that capitalize on our abilities and our distinctiveness as a nation. Our support for those businesses, more than any regulations, laws, or stimulus package, will drive economic activity so that growth settles back to a sustainable rate. A year ago, we all watched fast-moving and dramatic conditions unfold in the domestic and global economies. We knew ex instinctively we were watching enormous and unprecedented events, history in the making. And we're still watching history unfold. It's just that the pace has slowed and the fear has eased. But the current round of challenges are playing out in a less dramatic but equally powerful fashion. And we also know a lot more about our world, the causes and the effects, the players and their roles, the opportunities and the risks. Whatever happens in the next year is likely to be just as significant as what we've seen in the past 12 months. But I hope we will learn our lessons and not go back to the questionable practices that brought us to the edge. Instead, I hope we can move solidly forward, better and wiser for what we've been through. Thank you, and I'm going to look forward to taking your questions. Thank <laughs> you.